Jesus. You may be seated. Uh, she's gone. I can't pick on her. She's not there. Uh, I, I did get the evidence uh, today. Uh, I got a picture. I got a, a, evidence that, that Miss uh, Michaela was feeling a little bit better. She was smiling today. Uh, so that's a good thing. I, I, I was picking at her. I told her that was going to show up on, in the bulletin. But I, I'm not going to do that to her. I, no, 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 I'm not going to do that to her, so <laughs> we won't do that. Uh, you, you pray for them. I know they'd appreciate that. She's feeling some better uh, still, uh, and, you know, look like little chipmunks, you know, they're a little swollen. And, 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 anyway, uh, you pray for them. Uh, yeah, we had a great, a great afternoon. We got home this afternoon and uh, was uh, getting ready for lunch, and, and I went to the bedroom, was changing clothes, and all of a sudden I, I thought someone was attacking my wife. Uh, she, she was hollering at me, and I go running in there, uh, and, and we had a leak under the sink, and water was going everywhere, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so, you know, it, it was just one of those afternoons, you know, you just deal with it, uh, and you try to clean it all up, and get it all put back together, and, uh, and go from there. You know, I, I asked her what happened, and you know, did you hear something? She said, I don't know, all of a sudden, water was hitting my feet. Now, she knew that was not good, so... <laughs> Anyway, so we got that all outside. So I was kind of joking about our good afternoon. So, uh, but thank the Lord, we had a we have a house that can leak. Amen. Uh, we're, we're inside. Uh, come on, you gotta look on the bright side. Amen. All right, uh, I, I, I'm gonna have to do a little. Uh, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm gonna have to do a little uh, checking in there at St. Jude. I'm gonna have to have. I got a bone to pick with them. <laughs> Uh, they gave my house to somebody else. I don't know what that was all about, but uh, the St. Jude Dream Homes giveaway was today. We've been picking at Miss Katie for, I don't know, we, we, we bought a ticket that we donated to St. Jude uh, several months ago. Several. Uh, so ever since then, we've been picking it. And it just, it's fun because, it, you know, she kind of gets a little frustrated by it, you know. So I, I would tell her all the time, now you start getting your things ready because in August, you know, we're moving. 
you know, we're, we're going to get this house and we're moving. Now, Dad, you can. I said, no, no, that's my house. You know, you can, well, they gave it to somebody else today. I don't understand that. But anyway, <laughs> all right. I hope you have had a good day today. Uh, it has been water leak and all. It's been a good day. Uh, we've had a good day in the Lord. I had an opportunity to spend uh, a little bit of time today with Brother Robert O'Brien. Um, and we're going to begin uh, a discipleship time with he and his wife. And, and I want to encourage you, if you're interested, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do it for, for right now. It's scheduled for 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. That may change, but right now that's the way we're going to do it. And we're going to do it through messenger rooms. So it's going to be online. Uh, and we, we worked out the kinks today and kind of got that going. Uh, so if you're interested and you'd like to be, it's the same discipleship program that we did uh, in class st uh, style uh, several months ago. Uh, we'll go through the same set of lessons if you would like to get involved with that. And you can do an online thing if you'll let me know on Sundays. I'll send you the link and all you have to do is hit the button and it'll bring you into uh, that room. Uh, and then we'll be able, you can, you can use the video camera if you want to. If you would prefer not to be on camera, you can you can block that uh, and just do the audio. But uh, but that's what we're doing. So we're going to do that at four o'clock right now. Four o'clock on Sunday afternoon. His uh, his work schedule may change, which may open up an evening during the week that we might do that. But that's the plan right now. So if you're if you're interested, I just want to let you be aware of that. We also tried something Friday that, that I think we're going to try to do at least once a month to see how it works out. Uh, we did a, a prayer room uh, Friday evening, and I think we had four or five that, that got online and, and checked into uh, either the room or I did a Facebook Live as well, and some got on there on that Facebook Live. What we'd like to do is I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna call it a prayer room. We're gonna open it up uh, and, and probably do it for about an hour on Friday, uh, one Friday a month. Uh, and just, just a time where you can come in, uh, you can ask for prayer, request prayer, pray with us if you want to, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, we'll probably spend five or ten minutes at the beginning going over prayer requests, uh, and then we'll let folks pray that want to pray uh, while we're there. Uh, I don't think we can pray too much. Uh, so I, I thought that was something. That we've got the technology. Let's use it. Uh, and let's let the Lord uh, be honored and glorified through all that. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, a little bit more as we go forward. There's a couple of things that we'll need to take care of after church tonight. So if you, Miss Christie, if you will remind me so I don't forget, uh, we'll, we'll do that right after service tonight. All right. So I hope you came ready to sing. Uh, uh, I'm going to be nice. I'm just going to say it this way. Sing, sing, sing like you're happy. <laughs> Put a smile on your face. Let's lift our voices to the Lord. And let's let him know that we are here and that we are excited about being here and we want him to speak to our hearts. Okay, you remain seated. We'll sing the first, second, and last verses of Since Jesus Came Into My Heart.
Fred, I tell you. All right, well, let's all stand. And we're going to do another one that he does a little funky stuff on, of course. So we're going to sing the first, second, and last verses of Redeem.
about that time. Hallelujah. We talked about that time this morning. The Lord's going to turn to it. God the Father is going to turn to his son and say, Son, go bring my children home. Amen. Amen. What a day. What a joy that's going to be. Amen. Looking forward. Looking forward to that. Take your Bible tonight. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're really getting into the meat of the idea of, of this, this section uh, of 1 Corinthians. We started last week and talked about uh, the def or, or spiritual gifts defined. Uh, and we're going to pick up and, and finish that thought uh, as we go through this evening in 1 Corinthians, uh, starting down there with verse number 12. We did the first 11 verses last week, and we're going to finish the chapter Tonight, and we'll not go through every verse and, and, and dig into each one. Uh, I think a lot of this is, is really almost self-explanatory or, or very, very easily to understand. Uh, and then we'll get to, toward the, the latter part of this chapter, and it'll it, it'll begin to get a little more difficult. Uh, as I as I've been studying through First Corinthians, uh, it, it's it, it's interesting to me how the Lord so many times connects different things. Uh, different messages or, or different series of studies. I didn't I did not know when I started. I, we started eight to say I, I uploaded it this morning. Uh, eighty three it was the eighty third Sunday school lesson uh, that we've been doing this series through the Bible. We've been eighty three lessons, and, and I didn't uh, I didn't know eighty three lessons ago what I was going to be preaching tonight. But. Tonight, as we, or, or not specifically tonight, that I was going to be in 1 Corinthians at this time while we were talking about church history in Sunday school. But it's interesting how these really kind of combine and kind of come together as we see the culmination of church history and we're getting closer to that end. And we'll begin next week, we'll start looking a little deeper into what we will recognize uh, as, as different churches. Um, it's interesting that we are now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 are probably some of the most, <laughs> what, what, what's the word? It's not, not the most difficult. I, I guess we'll just use it this way. Some of the most misused chapters for the modern day church. I mean, you'll hear all kinds of stuff out of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. There's a group that's, that's real big today. And if I started naming names, some of you would probably know some of the names. And I, I'm not going to do it today. Uh, we, we may do it in Sunday school. So if you're interested, you need to, to, to watch the Sunday school or come to Sunday school to watch the Sunday school lessons. But th there's a big group today. And, and they call themselves the uh, New Apostolic Reformation. That's the name that they have for their group of churches today. The New Apostolic Reformation. And, and, and it's exactly what, what, it, what it sounds like. Uh, they believe and, and they hold that uh, their leadership, there, there are apostles today just like or that are connected with the apostles that lived in Jesus' day. And they have the same authority, uh, and they have the same uh, 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 ability. Uh, they are the new apostles. And, and they are ordaining or conferring apostleship onto each other. I saw a video the other day where they were conferring apostleship onto one of their friends who, in their mind, has, has demonstrated the uh, the whatever they call, I forget what the word they use, but uh, demonstrated the fact that he was an apostle and, and they had a service. I mean, they had five or six of them up there and they were laying on hands and they were conferring on him the, the, the title and the authority of an apostle. What's the Bible say about it? Now, I, I'm not... I'm not preaching this just to stir up trouble. I mean, we started in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, but we cannot run from what's here. So, so my question is, what does the Bible have to say about that? And, and, and if the Bible speaks to that, 
Uh, how, how do we respond according to what the Bible says? 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. Now, now we, we've gotten to the place to where we understand the book of Corinthians is written to a young church that is struggling with its identity. And, and it's struggling with its acceptance or practice of biblical Christianity. Now, we understand the church of Corinth did not have the New Testament to go to and say, okay, what does the Bible say we do in this situation? So, for their time, they did the next best thing. They wrote to Paul and said, uh, Apostle Paul, would you please help us in these areas? And he's answering their questions. He's been doing that for several chapters now. And the same thing is going on in chapter 13, 14, 12, 13, and 14. It's just his subject on, in these three chapters happens to deal with spiritual gifts. We talked about the definition last week. We're not going to go back and re-preach that. But tonight, tonight we, we want to hit this major point before we get to chapter 13. Because it's fixing to be, it, it's fitting to be on. You get to chapter 13 and 14, it's, it's, it's funky. So he finishes chapter 12 when he defines spiritual gifts knowing the human flesh. He's going to remind us that in all of these diversities of gifts and all of these things that he's talked about, the main thing that he's preaching and, and, and pinpointing in this chapter is unity. He's going to deal with unity in our calling. He's going to deal with unity in our place. And he's going to deal with unity in our practice. But the overall theme is unity. We've got to get back to a place. And I understand and I know our world is, is, is running headlong for a one world government. And I understand that our world is heading uh, headlong toward a one world religion. I, understand, I am not blind to biblical prophecy. But I do know this. As long as the Lord leaves us here, we have a responsibility. Amen. We have a responsibility to be shining lights in a dark world. We have a responsibility to show forth the peace of God in a world of this. I'm preaching a message from this morning. In a world of dissension. We have a responsibility as children of God that we not be deceived but we be convinced by the word of God. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, look at verse number 12. We're going to start reading there. So again, some of this we're going to read very quickly, and I think the point will be very evident. Uh, then we'll spend some time there at the bottom of the chapter uh, for a little bit. We'll, 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 okay, verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and whether we... And, and, and have been all made to drink into, the, into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. For if the foot say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the reading of your word. Pray that you'll help us tonight. Help us just to, to see the wisdom that you've placed in your scriptures and the unity that you've given us if we will simply submit ourselves to you and let you move and work and have your will in your way in our lives. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we start off with this idea of where we are placed. He starts off in verse number 12 and he deals with this illustration or this idea of the body. But, but he 
wants us to understand that we are placed by God in that local body of Christ. I really think that if we could understand, and I don't, I really don't know, I, I think because there has been such a misunderstanding about the local church and such a misunderstanding about what this body is all about, uh, that we've, we've come to a place where we don't recognize what God has done in placing individuals into that local body. I, I've said this before, and I'll ask you this question again tonight. Why has God placed you here? I do not believe it's an accident when anybody walks in the back door, or now we need to say this, right, in, in this day of COVID, or, or signs in online, that it's not an accident that God has orchestrated and brought folks to our fellowship. Why has he done that? What's his purpose? We, we can go, we can spend a lot of time tonight, we're not going to do it, but we can spend a lot of time tonight going back into the New Testament, going back to, to finding out why he established his church and what it was all for, and, and we've done that quite extensively in Sunday school, uh, so if you have any questions there, go back and pick up those Sunday school lessons, uh, but just suffice it to say, God has placed us, and that's exactly what we saw in our reading, he said in verse 13, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. He's saying, listen, God is orchestrating and God is working to put you where he wants to use you for his honor and his glory. I think one of the difficulties, I think one of the difficulties for the American church Is that for most of us, we've never been in a place where we did not have a church to go to. For, for most of us, it wasn't a question of, can we go to church today? It was a question of, where are we going to go to church today? And for most of us, if we were honest, for most of us, we had several good churches to choose from where we went. I wonder, and, and it, it is so hard for us to understand this, coming from the Bible Belt. I mean, I talked about that this morning, about every little town has its church. You know, and, 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 and you get farther, a little farther south, and, and you know, this is going to be an, uh, an odd saying. I apologize if you're a cat lover, but, you know, uh, where, where, I'm, where I come from, it was like this. You know, uh, you couldn't sling a cat where I'm from without hitting a Baptist church. I mean, there's just that many of them everywhere you look. So sometimes it's hard for us to understand when we say, well, you know, they're, they're looking for a church. They're trying to find a church home. They're looking for a place to go. Well, listen, there are still places in our society today. There are still places in America where it's going to be difficult to find a good, sound church that follows the word of God to attend. Unfortunately, I think what's happened is we have become complacent and we take for granted the fact that we have a church to go to. <laughs> I saw on the internet this afternoon while there were no one showed up to arrest anybody at North Valley Baptist Church and Brother Jack Trevor in California. What I read on the internet was that there were thousands that showed up this morning. Attend church service. I'm talking about following the Lord and, and, and letting understanding what church really means to us. I, I hope we have I hope we've gotten a glimpse of what it means to not be able to gather together. In this capacity. Oh, I, I love preaching. And, and I'll, I'll preach to anybody. Ask my wife. I'll preach to her. She slows down long enough. 
But it was just different standing here trying to preach to an empty room. It's different. It's different to come to this place, walk through the halls and walk past Sunday school rooms that have been dark for six months. It's, it's difficult to walk into a fellowship hall and, and stand there and look around and think and remember all the times that just in the last two years that I've been here that we've met in there and we've fellowshiped and you've heard the laughter and, and, and you've heard the joy and you've heard the children and, and all the things and, and to stand there and it to be dark and to be silent. Why has God placed us here? What's our purpose? Because we have to get back to that thought that God in particular put us in this place. Why? We read about the, in verse 14, we read where he started talking about unity. And we could spend, we, we, could, we could preach a long time right here, we're not going to do it. We're going to preach a long time right here on this idea of unity. And he goes through and he uses that illustration of the body. And, it, and it's kind of an interesting illustration, right? If the foot say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Well, if I can't do that job, I'm just not going to do it. Well, if I can't have that position or I can't have that place, well, I'm just not going to do it. The illustration here is how foolish would it be for, for the foot to say, well, I'm just not of the body. That's ludicrous. And then he asked the question. Verse 16, if the ear say, because I'm not of the eye, I'm not of the body. And then, and then the eye says that, and that's, I didn't go far enough. Uh, but uh, he, he talks about the idea uh, of, uh, where did we read that? Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? God has orchestrated and God has put us all in place on purpose that in unity we can serve him. Look at verse number 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body as it Pleased him. Now we get the illustration of the human body. We also understand the application that he's dealing with in the church body. He, he is reminding us that we are placed by God for his honor and his glory. Now, he goes on. And spends quite a bit of time. We're not going to read all of this. But he goes on and spends quite a bit of time going through here. Verse 20. But now are, the many member, are, are they many members but, but, yet, but yet but one body. And he goes and repeats that idea. By the eye cannot say unto the hand I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet I have no need of you. Nay much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. See, never forget, we're all necessary. It seems like we've gotten to a place where we've fallen into that, that trap or that doctrine of the Nicolaitans where it seems like we've, we've said, well, some are, are, are over here and, 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 you know, some are preachers and deacons and trustees and, and some are, are, are servants over here and then others are over there. No, the Bible does not teach those things. It teaches a unity in Christ that we're all equal serving God. Go to verse 26 and we'll catch the last part of this. Because we've talked about the idea of being placed and I really don't know how to emphasize that any more than what we've already said. That we are placed by God. And I don't, please don't take this wrong. But we need to understand that if we are not in God in the place that God would have for us to serve, we need to find that place. Right. 
We need to get in there. We need to serve with all we have. So verse 26 brings us to an introduction of our purpose. And here's where it's going to get a little fun, all right? Verse 26, the Bible says this, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. So we're talking about the unity of the body. And then he says in verse 27, Now ye are the body of Christ, look at this, and members in particular. Now, we read the Bible carefully and we read it slowly because now what we want to see is he's, he's dealing. And, and a lot of folks want to, want to rejoice and they want to talk about how we're, be, we're bodies, we're members of the body of Christ and, and we're in the body and we're in the, the, the church of God. And, and, we, and a lot of folks want to talk about that and deal with that, but they forget the next part of that verse. It says we are members in particular. He deals with the idea of just a specific assignment that we've been given. And, and, and the reality is, I cannot fulfill your assignment, and you cannot fulfill my assignment. We are assigned by God specifically, particularly, as the Bible said, to do what God's called us to do. Verse 28. God set son. Now, he's going to start talking about now, he's going to shift gears a little bit, uh, and he's going to give us an understanding or an idea of, of, of some of the, the ways that he worked and he moved according to Scripture. Notice what he says. And God hath set son. Again, we're starting off with the God setting principle. And God hath set some in the church first apostles. That word first, that word first literally deals with an idea of succession. He, he's starting off and he's saying, now I'm going to give you a succession of things that I have used for his honor and his glory that I have given. Notice what he said. He said first apostles. We understand that an apostle is one who's sent by God. But I, I just want to stop here and I just want to ask a simple question. Of course, I already know the answer to this question. <laughs> so be careful. Were there any specific qualifications for an apostle? In the Bible. Do we know. Let me rephrase that. Let me ask it again. In this manner. Are there any. Is there any qualification in the Bible. That would. Limit. Apostles. In the scripture. Okay, let's get a little more point. For those who are claiming apostleship today, and are claiming the same, it's, it's almost a Pope-like succession for them. Is there a, is there, is there a Bible that, that talks about that? Take your Bible. Turn to the book of Acts. Chapter number 1. Acts chapter number 1, I'm just going to show you a verse of scripture. You, you can deal with it however you want to. Acts chapter number 1. Because we're given an event. It's, it's interesting uh, that this question is answered in scripture. We have an instance. Remember, remember there, was a, there was an apostle that, that was not. Matter of fact, in, in Psalm, there's a prophecy uh, that told about this and said that someone was going to take his place. Acts chapter number 1. Go to verse 20. Well, 
let's back up. Let's get the whole thing. We'll go back to verse 15. And let's just not throw verse 20 out there. All right, let's get the context. Acts chapter 1, verse number 15. The Bible says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of, of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs be, have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and, his, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem insomuch as that field is called in the proper tongue Aseldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. So in an instant that we're given an instance in the Bible, well now we're down, we're sure an apostle. Now I don't mean that ugly, I don't mean that um, uh, uh, ir uh, irreverent. But they've got to replace an apostle. That's what's going on. How do they do that? Keep reading. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. They appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, uh, thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lot, their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now it seems to me that there were some uh, qualifications that were mentioned in what we just read. Some qualifications that would make it very, very difficult for anyone today to claim authority or ability to identify and become an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Namely, notice what it said, Beginning uh, verse 21, wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Number one, they walked with them while Christ was there on the earth. I, I don't know of anybody alive today. Now you preacher, you're being facetious. Yeah, kind of. But there are men walking around today claiming the same authority. Claiming the same power as these apostles. He goes on, beginning from the baptism of John, that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be in witness with us of his resurrection. Some will say, well, the Apostle Paul, he was ordained an apostle later, was he not? Yes, he was. But you study the life of Paul. I didn't write the verses down. But you study the life of Paul. You're going to find that Paul spent his time in the wilderness with the Lord. Yes, he was one called out of due season. I, I'm just kind of trying to lay out the scriptures and say, listen, we've got, we want to do things correctly and we want to be right with the Lord because once we start down the wrong path, 
Nowhere, nowhere, no telling where that path is going to end. That is the old illustration, and I'll move on. It's the old illustration of the, the railroad track. Where I grew up, we had a railroad track that ran down by our house. And, and, and we could walk down that railroad track, and there was a spur off of that track. We could walk down that railroad track, cross the trussle, and get on the, that spur, follow that spur around, uh, and it would carry us all around to a store down there. But it was interesting thing about that spur. Once you got on that spur on that railroad, when you first started off on that spur, it would be right there next to the track. But the farther you walk down that spur, the farther you got away from the main track. And if you followed that spur very long, pretty soon you were way away from the truth. You were way away from the main track if you follow. That's what happens when you get into error. It leads you away from the truth. So go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll pick up reading there. God set some of the church first apostles. Secondarily, prophets. And the word there is used as a comparison of two. There seems to be a, a, a separation, and we'll see this as we go through this list. There seems to be a separation here between these two and the rest, the apostles and and the prophets. And, and, and we're talking about, we're talking about prophets, we're talking about uh, those that had the ability to foretell the future. There are several folks running around. I, I guess, can you run around on, on, on the internet? I, anyway, uh, there, there are several folks that are, that are on the internet today that are claiming that they prophesied uh, that, that COVID was going to show up. And they give some vague reference to they said something bad was going to happen in the future. <laughs> yeah, something's good. I can say that today. Well, something's bad is going to happen in the next two weeks. Something bad's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, they got two hurricanes going on down the Gulf. Wow. He's dealing with this idea of those that are foretelling the future. Hey, let me just say this. A prophet of God, a true prophet of God is never wrong. Right. Study your Bible. Right. So, so I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to throw it out there. Now, you, don't, don't get mad at me. I'm just, I'm just a messenger. Kenneth Copeland is a liar. Why would you say that, preacher? Because I've heard him twice curse COVID-19 and prophesy that it was over and ended and done and gone. March 29th was the first time he did it. They calculated 170,000 deaths. Now, I don't know about that number, but they've calculated 170,000 deaths. A true prophet of God is never wrong. He goes on, and he talks about, and thirdly, teachers. And when I read that, my mind, the first thing that my mind went to in this progression, we have the apostles that were there. Uh, we had those that were prophetic in giving the word of God, uh, those that wrote scripture. Many of them were apostles, some weren't. Um, we had those prophets of God in the early days of the church. And then as you progress through the church, uh, then you have 1 Timothy chapter number 3, which talks about a pastor teacher. You'll find, you'll look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, you'll find that those two words are connected. A pastor, teacher. So we are working our way through the members of the body of Christ as given by God for use in his service. After that miracle, There's no denying the fact in the New Testament we see the working of miracles. There, there's no denying that fact. And, and there's no denying the fact that you find in the Great Commission uh, in, in Mark chapter 16, you, you find the statement that they'll, uh, they'll drink poison, they'll be bitten by, by, by scorpions, and, and these things won't hurt them. You, you, you can't deny those things that were written in the Scripture.
My struggle today, while I believe God's in the healing business, and God can still do exactly what God desires to do, my struggle today are these guys who claim to have the gift of healing, and we have scores of hospitals full of folks who need healing. I could call names today of folks in our church who need a physical healing. Where are these faith healers? Then it's interesting to see the, 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 a distinction that's made here. I have not figured this distinction out yet. It just is something that boggles my mind. But he talks about, look at the list that he gives. Apostles, prophets, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, look, the gifts of healing helps governments in diversity of tongues. There seems to be a distinction. I, I, I don't understand what it is, uh, but, he, but he lists them differently. He lists miracles, which are supernatural acts, and then he lists gifts, which are favors of God that are given. Uh, we, we find somehow, I don't understand it, but there seems to be a distinction there. And in these gifts, we find four things that he mentions. He find, we find healings, which deals with the curing of the physical. We find helps, which deals with relief of situations. We find governments, which deals with direction or leadership or guidance. And then we find diversities of tongues, which deals with a communication of the gospel. So we list five things here. And in verse number 29... Yeah, we're almost done. Verse 29, he asked these things. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? No, we all have our place. We all serve God in different manners. But he finishes with verse 30, which is intriguing. Which, which ought to spark that interest for what's to come. Notice what he says. Have all the gifts of healing. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Have all the gifts of healing. Do all speak with tongues. Do all interpret. Verse 31. But. Covet. Earnestly. The best. Gifts. He just mentioned. And I've seen a lot of teaching in the last few weeks on these five areas that are claiming supernatural ability. But Paul says in verse number 31, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Now look at what he says, and yet show I unto you a more excellent Way. What's he saying in verse number 31? He's saying, I, I, I'm showing you the, the, the orchestration of God. I, I'm showing you how God has worked. The apostles came and they were here. The prophets were here giving the word of God. Uh, the pastors and teachers are on the scene teaching and preaching and doing these things. Uh, we've seen great miracles that have taken place. We've seen gifts that have demonstrated the hand of God. But there's something better on the way. That's what he says. I show unto you a more excellent way. One with more superiority, one with better mood, one with better means. The longer, the longer we live, the longer we live in the old way. the less we experience the excellent way. More we try to seek and to stay in those things that God is, says expressly that I'm going to show you something better, the more we're living hindered, the 
from doing the things of God. I understand this is controversial. I, I understand that there are a lot of folks today that make all of these big claims and say a lot of big stuff. It all comes back down to this. Just a guy on the Bible. And I love you. And I'm for you. But I'm going to stick with this book every time. Amen. It's our desire as we dig into 1 Corinthians and we see chapter 13 is next. A more excellent way. Chapter 13 is next. You, you understand. I'll let the cat out of the bag. You understand that chapter 13 is all about faith, hope, and charity or love. Oh, that we would Stop trying to be religious show-offs. That was their problem. And that's the problem with a lot of folks today. Folks like that authority. They like to run around. They like to run around and sling their coat at people and have them fall back. They like placing their hand on people's heads and having them pass out. Because it looks good. And really, it probably feels pretty good. Just because it looks good, or just because it feels good, does not mean it's a God. Hands with my eyes are closed. Preacher, what was your point tonight? My, my point tonight is this there is a way that seemeth right for me. My point is this, the Bible is always right. And we will study. And we will get in the Word of God. And we'll let God speak to us. God will speak. God has a plan. He has a purpose. And He is working that plan and that purpose in us. I'll bring this all the way back to this one simple thought. Why are we here today? Why has God placed me and you in Calvary Baptist Church? Are we fulfilling our place? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the day. It is a joy just to be able to be in your house, to study your word. Father, I, I wish that there are so many things, so many deeper things that I don't even understand in this passage of Scripture. But as we've, as we've dug through and looked at this from the standpoint of just biblically, what, do you, what have you said? Pray that you'll help us. Help us to practice faith, hope, and charity. Help us to reach the lost with the gospel of Christ. Help us to live in a manner that's pleasing unto you. Father, we pray. We pray that you will break our spirit Bring us to that place of submission. That place of humbleness before you. It says it's not about what I think. It's not about my ideas. It's about you. We love you in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Heads your eyes are closed. Maybe tonight you'd like to get in this altar and just say, Lord, I, I, I want to be involved. I want to be in. I want to be in my place, fulfilling my purpose, doing what you've called me to do.
Maybe, maybe you've struggled with finding that place, that, that purpose, that niche that God has for you. It's a good time to get in the altar tonight and ask the Lord. Open our hearts and open our eyes. Show us that place of service that he has for us. Seated. You must be seated just for a moment. We've got a couple of things that we need to take care of. Um, 